Hello and welcome to the Ship Shape Podcast, a series of podcasts where we meet amazing people and talk about their experiences, personal, technical, and all related to the maritime world. Come and dive in, dive in. Today on the Ship Shape Podcast, we have Marius Popa. He's been in the marine industry for some time. He's been naval architect. He's in the energy scene. He's a visionary. And welcome to the show. Thank you very much for your invitation and for a very nice uh, introduction. Where are you uh, recording this from? I'm uh, now in Aberdeen, Scotland. Aberdeen is now my uh, home city. However, I was uh, born in Romania, somewhere close to Danube Delta. So, you know, one of the interesting things about your story is that you started off in like a essentially communism behind the Iron Curtain. And through your career, you've been able to travel and now you're out in Aberdeen. So going back to the beginning, what really got you into the maritime space to begin with? From my point of view, it's simple, but uh, probably it will sound complicated. My uh, native city, as I uh, says already, it's uh, on, uh, let's say, on the termination or the, the starting, depending on the direction of the Danube Delta. And it also pretty much the, uh, the most uh, upper point of the maritime Danube. Um, and um, from this point of view, uh, my city, uh, Galat, uh, has um, an old shipyard dated back in uh, at the end of the uh, 19th century and uh, obviously the related industry uh, now the shipyard it's uh, owned by the Daman group and uh, there are rumors that uh, it's considered uh, one of the the best uh, in the group and um, in the communist time uh, communists decided uh, uh, to have in uh, this city both the university or yeah the naval architecture section of the of the university a local university but what was unique in Romania in that moment uh, and uh, also the um, uh, research institute for uh, for ships <laughs> let's put it like this also in time this was the place where the first and probably the last uh, uh, offshore rigs romanian offshore rigs uh, have been built they were uh, pretty much the uh, the designs were americans you see uh, and uh, pretty much the communists bought the designs and uh, they did the execution in uh, in the shipyard in this city so uh, when i had uh, to uh, decide uh, what university i have to to go it was uh, in the last uh, years of the communist time i have to say that my first uh, option or selection w- uh, was uh, automatization it was called it in that moment in romania it was something regarding uh, computers and fancy things i was uh, i was quite performant uh, had very good performance uh, with mathematics uh, good enough on physics and so on but uh, my parents uh, told me that uh, they cannot really support me in bucharest in the capital city where this uh, university uh, was placed yep. communist time it was very difficult uh, really or communist people assumed that uh, if you are a full time student uh, you cannot really work at the same time so it was very difficult to make some pocket money or uh, to support myself so i says okay let's stay home and uh, at that moment i says what is the most prestigious discipline in my city and it was this okay it was another alternative but uh, uh, let's put like this uh, it was uh, more related to chemistry and food and things like that and it was not exactly my uh, bread and butter <laughs> you see so i competed there and uh, pretty much i uh, i i entered at the top of the list for naval architecture but uh, second uh, on the uh, let's say on the big uh, uh, picture and in this way i uh, entered uh, naval architecture there i have to say that uh, i fall in love slowly slowly yeah <laughs> you see? so it was not exactly a love at first sight it was right. uh, as i told you uh, more a matter of prestige rather than love 
Yeah. Uh, but I, I cannot say that it was also an arranged marriage because nobody forced me to uh, to enter it. It was uh, pure my decision. Again, it was really a matter of prestige. But I entered it there and uh, I fall in love slowly, slowly. This also due to some excellent uh, professors, teachers. Right. Uh, Can I just, on... um, I just want to say for those people who might not be too knowledgeable about it, because I don't think we should assume everyone has the same knowledge. Is there any chance you could just tell us what naval architecture actually is? Because I think people probably have a good understanding of engineering, but I'm not sure that everyone would actually know what naval architecture is. So could you give us the idiot's guide, please? Yes. Uh, when somebody is asking me about this, because uh, amazingly, I got tons of these questions uh, back in time in Romania, but now in Scotland as well. I'm telling them that uh, basically I know about ships. Is the simple answer. Okay, uh, probably I, I should say I know about uh, things what are floating because could be ships, could be rigs, it yeah. uh, could be various things. And I'm, to be honest, I'm very sincere about this, you see, because in reality, strictly speaking, the naval architect would be really what the architect is uh, in civil engineering. Yeah. You see, so is the guy who really or sorry, I apologize, uh, the the person, uh, she or he. No, no, (laughs) really. You see, because they are uh, amazing talents in all direction of the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, is that professional? What uh, really imagine an amazing uh, construction or assembly or whatever you want to call it. And uh, is doing its own his her own best. To materialize uh, this uh, construction, but it's on a on the very top of the process. Yeah, you see, and from many points of view, uh, has to delegate a lot of tasks uh, to other professionals. You see, so I agree that architect has to take in, into account, uh, let's say, the the limitation of the actual construction technologies. You yeah. see. And uh, probably will do some kind of uh, high level calculations or something like this. But I think that the detailed calculation, the very detailed calculation about strength, for example, are, are done really by the builder, by the constructor, specialized in concrete or specialized on steels or specialized on, I don't know, chains, glass or something like this. The same also when it comes about systems, about piping, air conditioner, uh, things like this. By the letter, the naval architect will be that group of people at the beginning of the project what are really putting together the big uh, aspects of the ship. Yeah. You see, Uh, for example, one big aspect of the ship is the the compartments, how the vessel will be divided, you see. Yeah. It's a lot of a thing to be done here because it's depending on the function of the vessel, depending what what space are needed for various functions or roles, you see. So how much cargo you want to car- carry, what type of equipment you will have. The, the dimension of the equipment will depend on the energetic solution on board, on how much speed do we like, you see, to have. Uh, on <laughs> At the end of the day, what vendor you will select. <laughs> you yeah. see, so if they are able to do something tiny or they are, uh, they will come with something bulky, you see, yeah. what money you have available and all of this. So through the pure naval architect are that team what are doing what it's called the basic concept yeah. of the ship. I have to say that their decision are tremendously important because a mistake in that moment could have... Yeah huge, huge consequences for the entire life of the vessel. I'm not saying only building. I'm saying I've, everything after. I've Absolutely. seen um, some episodes. There was this TV show out here in America. It's called Sea Disasters. And uh, one of them was that essentially there would be a, a wave. And when the big cargo container got right on top of the wave in which pretty much all of the weight was in one point the ship would just snap yes and um there was i think it was something to do with like poor welding or something that eventually gave way but i'm not Um, sure uh, in your situation you see i don't want to comment that this is a a standard case for launch non-strength however could go 
wrong uh, or and really could be manufacturing troubles but uh, regarding this it, it's a very interesting aspect what i'm i'm continuing to tell people in 2005 the larger container carriers they were in the range of 10000 units teu and uh, the vessel was the standard vessel with the surface structure positioned aft and makes a lot of sense because uh, it will be a white deck there in the middle. You see, so a lot of containers will be there and so on and so on. So they were already some solutions where the superstructure, uh, but this type of vessel suffered exactly from what you says and suffered a lot, much more than an oil tanker, for example, because it's an open section, how we call it. And the open section also have torsion problems uh, on diagonal waves and things like that. And due to this, for example, top of the hedge combings, the longitudinal hedge combings, uh, were going to thicker and thicker and stronger materials. Uh, I remember from my uh, junior years surveying in shipyards, welding of 80 millimeters, 100 millimeters thick plates, what it's a nightmare. And uh, high stencil steel, very difficult to weld, a lot of cracks after and things like that. And suddenly in that moment when people were looking to solution to sort out this, I remember that a certain, let's let's not call, not name nations or companies or something like this, but let's put like this, a certain nation from Asia, uh, the engineers from there, they says that they developed an amazing steel, an amazing steel, what was really arresting the cracks. Majority of the engineers, they were... (laughs) You see, a little bit doubtful about this. But the names in discussion there, they were quite great. And we says, okay, maybe it's like this. But the idea, the bottom line was, and, and the, the really the jump to larger vessels was not due to fancy materials or things like that. But the jump to larger vessel was then when a naval architect understood the nature of the problem and pretty much took the superstructure and the bunkering the bunkering spaces and all of this and start to rearrange uh, with a lot of um, gravity you see with a lot of courage rearranging all of this to the middle of the vessel in such a way that if something like this will happen the bending of the vessel, what will bend the vessel like this, won't be maybe so like this, won't be so bad. Let's go like this. By doing this cleverly, we have now vessel of 24,000 TEU. So when you look to the modern, very large container carriers, you'll see that the superstructure is not anymore at the aft part or in the aft third. It's really in the middle. Also by doing this, the torsion problem was mitigated, was made smaller. Anyhow, these are details, but this, for example, emphasizes, in my personal opinion, the importance of the naval architect and the naval architect or the group of naval architects having that idea, in my opinion, I can only applaud and yeah. says, yes, they did a notch <laughs> yeah. in, in the history of naval architecture. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing about naval architecture, because I, my background is in yachting and I've interviewed, you know, yacht designers and all the rest of it. And I think yacht designers get a lot more credit than the naval architects, especially in, in the yachting industry. There's a lot more attention given to them because what they do is so visible and also easier to explain. It's easier to explain yacht design, I think, probably. But without the naval architect, you know, you're absolutely stuffed, aren't you? You know, it's something that really has to take take uh, plenty of time and, and concentration. Uh, now depends what you understand by yachting. If you understand by yachting a reasonable, a small, I apologize for using small, but as you can observe, uh, for me, a boat start probably on 70, on 70 meters is still small. <laughs> you see? But yeah. for a small, a small boat, what is designed uh, eventually with sails, you see what is designed for, uh, I will call it a speed and pleasure, speed and leisure. I think that the most important there is the shape, uh, what will give the speed, what will give eventually stability. Yeah, because stability, it's also a matter for uh, war. In my opinion, it's a big matter for something like this. But the leisure, the leisure will come, in my opinion, from the direct exposure to the um, current, air current coming from speed. 
you see, rather <laughs> from the direct exposure coming from rain or from uh, ugly uh, cold uh, wind uh, there. What I want to say here is the fact that really what it's inside in that boat the compartmentation, the spaces, the utilities, and things like that, what, yeah, in a way will will fell in to the naval architect. Okay, naval architect takes care also about the shape. Okay, still a specialist will, will have the, the last decision there, or not the last, it will come with the proposals, you see. But I'm trying to say that uh, maybe the focus here, it's completely in other things. When it comes about the yachts, like uh, we are uh, seeing now in news about the yachts of the multimillionaires uh, from a certain part of the world now in conflict with another part of the world, what are or they are not arrested in different parts of the world. <laughs> you see something like this. That yachts are completely other discussion. So leisure there, it's completely in other format. That, that gets to another good point. So when you look at the maritime industry, right? Because I'm coming from the leisure marine and uh, Georgia is coming from super yachts. Leisure marine didn't really start until kind of like the late 50s, 60s. And it's a relatively new thing. But where you're coming from, there's a whole heritage that goes back hundreds of years. And so it's a it's a unique type of experience. When I was doing some background research on the companies that you work for in the past, you know, some of them were going in the 1800s, you know. Lloyd's of, is the the, la- yeah. the oldest one going end of the 18, yeah, 18, uh, eight, late, uh, 1790 something or 80 something. And, and uh, the history of how these companies emerged, it's also an amazing social and economical history. Yeah, I don't know if we have time to discuss all of this. <laughs> Yeah, but I agree with you. You see, I want to tell you something. It's a very wise uh, and old, apparently, Chinese word. What says that for the potter, the most important is the pot. For the merchandiser, the most important is the emptiness of the pot. So this is bringing you the two different perspectives in discussions here. And the beauty, the magic, is to overlap these two perspectives as much as possible. But we need to remember, for the naval architect, for the builder, for the shipyard, the pot, the ship. For the owner, for, but the owner of the, of the cargo vessel. Uh, he's interesting how much the vessel can carry, how much the, uh, will be the cost of carriage. For the owner of the leisure boat, important is really the leisure. Uh, how much wind he, he or she will have in the face. For the owner of a super yacht, it will be more important probably to uh, to go outside in the world with his friends, with uh, his pairs. And eventually when they come, uh, I learned it, that situations like this are possible. When they come from the scuba diving, he will be able to say, look, my yacht is that one because the stern tube is shining. For the other ones, the stern tube is not shining. So um, because you've done surveys right and that's obviously part of like the whole process i found it interesting that marine surveyors ultimately were born out of the idea that when people were doing the initial trade routes and all of that you didn't know what quality of boat was going to be transporting anything and by creating these this job role of maritime surveyor it greatly increased how much trade was actually like passed around through the countries. Um, and insured all of these merchants. Okay, let's discuss about the the nice story of Mr. Lloyd. <laughs> Lloyd. <laughs> because uh, this is the answer for you, uh, honestly. Uh, Mr. Lloyd apparently was, uh, uh, was um, uh, had a coffee shop, not a tea shop, in London, on Thames, on the Thames shores. And uh, uh, because... Uh, it was very fanciful, uh, all of this. Uh, he had a lot of customers uh, from, yeah, you can imagine Thames. There were a lot of uh, merchandisers uh, and a lot of owners, uh, captains, and so on. And uh, Mr. Lloyds apparently was a person who listened a lot. Uh, and at a certain point, he started to cross some dots. And uh, I imagine uh, himself uh, maybe advising some uh, friends uh, telling them that uh, he heard uh, that maybe uh, that boat is not um, so trustful or maybe the crew has a 
or the captain has a drink problem or uh, maybe something dodgy with the, mm -hmm. the cargo, you see, uh, things like this. At a certain point, Mr. Lloyd started to make some nice money by consulting in this way. What is cool? Nothing to say. Okay, things was that Mr. Lloyd died. Everybody died, yeah, you see. <laughs> But after a while, the industry started to feel, uh, to miss him. And uh, apparently a group of entrepreneurs decided that uh, they need an entity to do what Mr. Lloyd did, like one person. <laughs> this is the funny thing, mm -hmm. <laughs> you see. And in this moment, that first association was establish it and this first association start to do the same thing to gather information you see to to give consultation and they start to classify the ships and they start to register so to register ships and in the register to classify the ships or to have eventually different i, I don't know exactly these are you can imagine but they start to register and classify And their main function initially was for the insurer, but also for the person, uh, for the merchandiser, let's put like this, you see. Slowly, slowly, also the owner, they became interested to prove the that value of the boat. Yeah. The value of the boat, the, the fact that the boat is uh, safe, uh, that they want to uh, sink it, it in the middle of the ocean and take the insurance, or you see, a lot of things could happen. Yeah. The business developed and helped the industrial development of the Great Britain. Apparently, this was very much observed by other uh, nations on the brink of the industrialization. And this is, in my opinion, is the key word, industrialization. Here, it's about the history. So hence, the next one, guess what? The next uh, similar association was founded in the French influence area. Uh, if I remember uh, well, it was really f founded in Belgium, but Belgium, you know, it was under the big influence, Napoleon time and things like that. So something 8021 or something like this, you see, and it was the Bureau Veritas, the, yeah, the next one. But what, I'm, what I want to stress, it was the next nation what was very due for industrialization. The German Schalloid, for example, came very late in this history due to the fact that the German states, despite the fact that they were very, very, very much on the uh, on the way to industrialization, but they were very fragmented. And German Lloyd came like entity very close to the moment uh, when Germany was unified by Prussian Empire, you see, something like this. So it's very interesting how somebody studying the history can see that every time when an industrial country emerged, the uh, classification society was there close. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this creates a very interesting thing because I think that maritime remain the only industry where this uh, functions and role have not been took by uh, the authorities, by the states. Well, I was a history major in college and I absolutely love hearing a maritime history. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just yeah. looking to the present then, um, what do you, you know, how do you view the state of the maritime industry today? So on a very top view, without uh, going in the details of crisis and things like that, I want to tell you one thing. Maritime industry, uh, by definition, uh, it's a very conservative industry. Mm -hmm. But from time to time, there are some kind of, uh, uh, of uh, pushes for moder moder modernization. Yeah. So it was the matter about the steel hull. It was the matter about steam, uh, diesel, uh, okay, uh, things like this. I think that indeed we are now on the... Uh, I would say that we are more than on the brink. I think that we are on the way to go deeply in a modernization process. Yeah. This modernization process, I think, is driven by uh, definitely by digitization, but it's also driven, in my opinion, and uh, so I'm afraid that digitization and it's accepted and recognized by everybody like a, uh, like a drive for all of this. But personally, I think that uh, it's a drive there in a change of philosophy due to the impact of the offshore. Yeah. For me, the offshore industry is just the newest branch of the maritime industry. The maritime industry, in my opinion, has uh, the traditional transport, the new one, the offshore industry, but they are both maritime. 
yeah. this is the way how I thought. And the offshore industry came with a new philosophy, what is very much risk-based, what is fundamentally different from the uh, classic traditional uh, prescriptive-based logic of the, of the classic maritime of the transport. The risk-based philosophy, in my personal opinion, is good because can accelerate the transformation and uh, adopting the new. The so change. do you think that the maritime industry can learn from this kind of offshore element then as, as a consequence? Because as you say, the philosophies are different. I think that both uh, <laughs> the offshore can learn from the classic transport yes. and the maritime could learn from offshore. And the funny thing is that probably I'm one of I apologize. I don't want to put myself on uh, on spotlight or something like this. But We've, we're putting you on the spotlight by interviewing you. It's okay. <laughs> You're right. You're already there. <laughs> yeah, indeed. So let's not waste the the chance. Honest. Yeah. When I came in Aberdeen in 2007, I was very sheepy. You see, yeah. so uh, the people here told me this: uh, you are very sheepy because I uh, I had experience in oil tanker, in, in uh, container vessels, in uh, bull dry cargo vessel, bull cargo and uh, bull cargo and so on, bull carriers. But when I came here and I start to tell them to various people, okay, me to tell, but mm, to people working in this industry for years and years and years, and I start to tell them, no, you should not do this. This is completely wrong. This is a blasphemy or something like this. And people were, (laughs) we are doing this for years and years and years. Nothing special happens. So what what are you telling us? You see, and that was a pain for me adjusting from shippy to oiled. It is a it was a pain. I'm proud now that I I adjusted myself in my opinion quite successfully, but I I want to say that in this moment I don't consider my, my myself anymore shippy, not oiled. No. Mm. I consider- you can't you can't fully lose the shippy element. No. It stays with you, doesn't it? <laughs> Meryl, yes. are you, how shippy are you, do you think? Who me? Yeah, are you shippy? Well, I the first time I ever really started reading about oil rigs was before this interview, which was fascinating. I <laughs> I didn't realize how you had a document in which you talked about kind of the depths of some, some of these oil rigs. Yeah. And one of them was like 7,000 feet. And I was like reading this while I was on like a 32 foot story building. And I was like, OK, this is 400 foot view and Then yeah. I'm like, oh, my God. I don't even know how humans have been able to create such things. Yeah, though I am going to have to Google what 700 feet is because I don't know. Or no, 7,000 feet. 7,000 feet is how many meters? 3,000 meters, three kilometers. There we go, thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. something like this. But Or two, two, no, no, two, two, I think. Uh, Two, two something, two between three and three kilometers. But yeah, but coming back, so I think I think both industry could uh, could learn from each other, and uh, I think in a certain way they are doing. And uh, for example, I think that this is the magic of um, uh, what I try now to do, and I think this is the magic of the offshore construction, for example, because it's combining uh, the uh, these two aspects. You see. And in general, the society has to understand that if we want to expand into the sea and oceans, we need ships like working platforms. So these ships are not anymore scratching the sea or the ocean from A to B. They are going from A uh, because uh, this is a funny because from authority point of view, for example, uh, a voyage is going from A to B and uh, from point of view of international convention and things like that. But it's a very good question. If an offshore vessel starts from Aberdeen, goes in the field and comes back in Aberdeen, is this a voyage? (laughs) Because... (laughs) doesn't match the definition in the IMO documents yeah, yeah, yeah. for ships. And uh, uh, we, we need to understand that these uh, uh, OSV vessels, for example, are working platforms. And today could uh, carry something for laying cable. Tomorrow can uh, do a well intervention. The next day uh, maybe could install uh, something for uh, for wind turbines. Next day could uh, launch uh, ROV or, or other unmanned uh, uh, survey uh, devices. It's an amazing versatility there. Yeah. Well, it sounds like there is just so much opportunity in this space as all these revolutionary things start to come around. So what tips would you give, you know, a younger person that is potentially looking at trying to make an impact in the world? Like what advice would you give? 
a young person uh, uh, willing to take this profession. Yeah? Yes. First of all, I told this young person to realize that uh, we are now in the same situation what was in uh, 19th century, uh, pretty much after the gold rush or after uh, Livingstone or, and Stevenson have uh, explored and charted, I don't know, continents, unknown continents. Mm -hmm. Because in my personal opinion, what the oil and gas company, they did by this uh, so-called uh, offshore oil and gas, excepting the fact that they took out the oil and the gas, what are pretty much equivalent to the gold nuggets. What they did also, they really mapped the territory they really got a much better understanding of what is there and what are the possibilities. Yeah. And by this comparison, I will ask somebody, okay, you know that California, and you know better, Marilyn, in California was a big gold rush about 1850. Yeah. But now when we talk about California, in what terms are we talking? Are we talking in terms of gold nuggets? No. Mm. <laughs> you see? And everybody wants to be in California, you know? So, or at least a big part, a big chunk of the population want to be there, what will be difficult because it's large, but not so large. And um, coming back, so it's the same situation, in my opinion. If that person, what has the future in front of, of him, want to be part of something, what in my opinion will be equivalent with the development of California, you see, and maybe to be uh, to uh, his, his or her child, you see, to be... Uh, maybe citizen of uh, California, if you want to say something similar, uh, he or she needs to jump in. In terms of, so we've obviously talked a little bit about this in terms of the fact the world's a little bit complicated at the moment. I don't know if anyone's noticed, but in terms of, you know, fuel and energy has never been in the news as much as it is at the moment. What do you see you know, as the kind of future, the, the fuel of the future for maritime and, and maybe more broadly. How do, what do you think about all that? I'm a big fan of nuclear, okay. but uh, nuclear quest a lot of wisdom, a general wisdom. What maybe like species we don't have yet, and it's sad to say this, uh, or maybe in order to have this uh, this uh, wisdom, we need also a, a more equal prosperity yes. uh, for more people. And definitely the electric, but probably in the form of uh, fuel, the fuel cells, uh, or even the the hydrogen in more classic formats, uh, will be uh, something. As a colleague of mine told me uh, very wisely, uh, we are in a moment now when nothing is clear, and we should not refuse any experiment, any option. Yeah. We we simple. Uh, we are we are pretty much like Edison, uh, willing to sort out the trouble of the bulb, you know, with the with the filament, what was still yeah. continuing to to burst and burst and burst. We are pretty much like Edison, maybe in a little bit better position than Edison was. Okay. When <laughs> hopefully, yeah, when we need to continuing searching uh, and studying. The funny thing is that uh, probably. The bottom line might be indeed electricity in various formats. You see, recently I learned it again that uh, China want to play the same big experiment like UK want to play and take solar photovoltaic in space because uh, having that photovoltaic panels in space will uh, gather pretty much the entire energy of the sun uh, on, uh, on that surface. You see what will be huge in my opinion and won't have problem of dust or other dirt on all of this. And after this, in a way to microwave it on the earth. Uh oh. You see? <laughs> yes. So as as my colleague says, if you can imagine uh flying fried chicken <laughs> <laughs> you see falling from sky. <laughs> that will be the case. But you you should wait until the you should not open the microwave door until this until sounds the like some weird dream I had. <laughs> After spending too much time at KFC, I don't know what you guys have over there. But, <laughs> you see, but the funny thing is that this is exactly the subject was uh, discussed in few science fiction books. And what, uh, what your favorites? What your favorite science fiction books that discuss this? Not really. They are good books, uh, but when I'm looking to a science fiction book, I'm 
I'm looking to thanks a little bit. <laughs> Let's put like this: uh, this was a, in a way a little bit too narrow on uh, on some facts, on on some issues, or something like this. You see, uh, when when I uh, discuss about uh, really a science fiction book, what I will uh, read it and read it again. I'm talking uh, about Dune or uh, Asimov <laughs> Foundation or uh, yeah, uh, Frank Herbert's Dune or. It in this uh, part of the of the books you see but coming back i think that the bottom line here that uh, we are still exploring and it's not clear for us what is the right direction i'm not such a big fan of uh, what is called biofuel in this moment excepting that the uh, biofuel could be somehow done from a bi biomass what is not really essentially for for food you see in a way yeah. or other because there are some uh, papers again saying uh, about the uh, biofuel made uh, from alga uh, or from kelp or something like this yes. yeah i've read about this but on the other hand the other papers are saying that the uh, alga or kelp uh, could be very useful for example for feeding uh, uh, they says that uh, uh, if cows will be fed with uh, kelp uh, probably they will not uh, damage the environment by their uh, by okay. um, gases <laughs> you yeah. see i'm not a specialist you see no, it's on no. the on the limit of fun all of this <laughs> you see i mean the thing is all of this is just I mean, I don't know how you feel listening to it, Meryl, but it's all just so, you know, there's just so many different possibilities. And, it, you know, I think the kind of uncertainty around, oh, we're not quite sure what the future is going to look like. Oh, it could be this. It could be that. There's so many different options. It's actually, you know, and verging on the world of uh, realm of science fiction, it's actually quite an exciting space for young people to be kind of entering this world and entering this whole sphere because it isn't clear quite how the future will look or how we'll power our vehicles and on the one hand that's quite unnerving because as human beings you know we like certainty um but on the other hand it is an exciting time to, to enter the space because you know if you can dream up the idea of you know floating fried chicken or you know whatever <laughs> then, then maybe maybe we can make it into reality and actually one of the things that struck me was this talk of floating cities can we go into that a little bit? What would be in your kind of dream floating city? How would you design it and what would be there? I think that uh, the idea of a huge pie, what pretty much I think it was uh, what uh, Joel Verne says in the float uh, in the propellant island uh, or island with propeller uh, you see i i don't know don't know exactly how how to translate in english or how it will be uh, but i think i think that that one is not exactly the most uh, viable idea also technically also economically from many reasons personally i think that uh, much more a kind of a modular design you see what uh, can assembly and disassembly depending on the uh, some depending not only on the environmental condition for example for for facing a storm but uh, maybe also for uh, uh, social conditions you see or economical condition you see, because uh, human aggregation could be also uh, due to these reasons. I, my gut feeling is that uh, something will be more viable. And definitely for the beginning, building uh, small units will be far more viable. Uh, we are, in my personal opinion, uh, we are heading uh, slowly, slowly in this uh, direction. Not to say, for example, that uh, uh, the big cruisers are pretty much floating cities, but uh, uh, floating cities uh, what are pretty much not s sustainable in in long run. You see, they are producing, but they are producing in another logic, you see, maybe on the shore logic rather than in, the, uh, in, in their own sustainable logic. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that one of the key elements there, uh, it's also to answer what is the plus value of the floating city let's say what the floating city brings to himself to itself to the people living there and also to the overall uh, society and economy you see yeah For, from this point of view for example i uh, i had a uh, a crazy uh, thought that uh, for example floating cities could be a crazy solution for uh, various groups of people uh, searching independence or searching a land of themselves God knows. But I think that, for example, a rig, in a way, it's a floating city. Uh, what, it's, uh, what, in a way, could be sustainable, 
in my personal opinion, because it's producing a kind of plus value. But when people will decide uh, really to live there, not only to take helicopters back and forth, it will be the first step. And the next step will be when the first kids will be born there and yeah. that kids will leave their childhood and their teenager there because what I discovered because yes as Romanian living in Aberdeen I see something about this communities what have been severed from their native places but I see that the kids what are born and raised here despite that they are in the uh, in a foreign community let's go like this uh, they feel themselves much more connected to the local place than their parents. So yes. I think that the first generation of kids what really have been will be born or or not necessarily born but raised they will have their childhood and their teenager time on such a let's say rig let's call it like rig or floating yes. city they will be the the ones the the first real citizen population of that one so imagine that such a kid is going to uh, to university on land and uh, discuss with a girl what he think that might be his lover you see and uh, start to tell story about how could be the sunset there or how yeah. he uh, went uh, to in the summer days uh, to swim nearby the for the other person will be completely wow <laughs> what are you telling yeah, me yeah. here <laughs> I mean, the thing is, the the skeptic in me thinks, well, uh, we've done a fine job of looking after the uh, the, the earth, haven't we? Um, what's to say that we're going to do any better with these floating cities? I mean, that's sort of how I feel about, you know, this idea of, uh, you know, colonizing other planets as well. We don't have the best track record. How do we know that humanity will learn and not just mess it up like we have with everything else? Just a, an optimistic take. I don't think that we have other chance. Again, discussing with another colleague uh, of mine, a good option will be moderation. I think that anyhow, it's a good option. But uh, for example, the real problem will be the demographic limitation. So just to request people to limit themselves to two, peop- uh, two children, eventually by exception three, because in reality you need a rate of 2.1, if I remember uh, well, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, for keeping uh, at two, the population is still going down. Yes. So, But the question, it's exactly like in, uh, in uh, Ender Game, if you know the book, what uh, 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 another science fiction book, what I'm insisting uh, to it was the first science, uh, science fiction book what my wife really appreciated and opened her taste for science fiction what is not exactly uh, so ample like my taste but now she has a taste for science fiction this is clear for me and uh, from this point of view for example the question is uh, what if the third or the fourth children will be uh, will have a huge contribution to humankind what if what if by limiting the the birth uh, we stop the genetic combinations and humanity will miss really something so going into um kind of going back a little bit you know i've heard that everyone's talking about like space and then they're like oh well i forgot what type of percentage it was like oh you know most of the ocean is like completely unknown how unknown is the ocean very unknown <laughs> <laughs> Very unknown. <laughs> It's there were people saying that we know better, we've mapped better Mars than uh, uh, than the bottom of the ocean. Simple because uh, there were some state agencies interested to uh, to send satellites and map uh, Mars, but they were not apparently so interested uh, to map uh, the sea bottom. But uh, don't worry. I think that the uh, Chinese are really working on this, <laughs> you see. And, uh, but there are also companies uh, what are targeting now deep sea mining. You see what I bet that they are doing a lot of, they're charting uh, really the territory. And as I told you also, I think the oil and gas company, they, they know much more simple because they operate there and they have a lot of tools. Uh, for doing this so but again there are other ideas uh, saying that going to the bottom of the oceans could be an excellent training for going uh, extraterrestrial because from this point of view the risks 
the bottom line of the risk is the same. So it doesn't matter uh, if uh, a crack is somewhere in cosmos, in okay, uh, in extraterrestrial, or a crack is somewhere uh, on the protection uh, uh, on the sea bottom. The the bottom line is dying is the same. So in and uh, uh, in cosmos, it's uh, uh, is the lack of pressure on the bottom is too much pressure. Yeah. So uh, in a way, you see, uh, people are saying that if we are master to work eventually to live there uh, we will be able uh, it will be an excellent training for doing this uh, also extraterrestrial and easier to um, easier to organize as well so i i don't know if you know this about me but i'm actually uh, planning to build my own oil rig um, <laughs> i'm not really but say i was where where should i do that where's oh. the best place for me to bo- to build my oil rig in a way, you see, it's a matter of looking to uh, what shipyards have uh, still have experience of doing this, you see. And after this, uh, entering in discussions with the shipyards and see what are the best offers. But again, there are many criteria to, uh, to, to be discussed here. I really don't know what to say because uh, uh, when I was uh, in, my, in my first part of my career, not only I was shitty, but I was, I was very much in contact with shipyards. Now moving here in Aberdeen, uh, I get definitely more oiled, but I lost the contact really with the shipbuilding industry. Mm. And I start to have a lot of contact, let's say, with the end users. We yeah. can call it like them operators or, or end users uh, of uh, ships, rigs, uh, equipment yeah. and so on. It's a complicated uh, story, but uh, uh, it's clear for me that the shipyard, in my opinion, is not exactly an, a national project. But I will say that it's very close to a national project. And uh, South Korea, for example, had shipbuilding as one of their five pillars for the development of the country. So some time ago, I don't know when was the 80s or uh, 1980s or 1990s, uh, I understood that uh, some politician, high top politician from South Korea decided that country need to be developed. And uh, they put it together a strategy for development. And again, I repeat, apparently they had something like five pillars for developing the country. And one was shipbuilding. And if one stage and analyze, will understand that shipbuilding has a lot of horizontal or transversal implication in the entire industries. Because a ship or a rig, it's a word per se. It's so. It's definitely more complex than a car. It's definitely more complex than a train. And it's really a small piece of work. And for this reason, we need so many industries and so many knowledges and so many input from the industries yeah. for building a ship. Okay, simpler is the ship, less input we have. We need, you see, more complex, more input we have. You see, like this uh, industrial... Uh, ships, especially for offshore or for an LLG transport uh, ship, what it's an ex- amazingly complex ship and so on and so on. So in my personal opinion, this really was lost in the vision of many governments. And to understand that having uh, units, economical units capable to build a ship, it's a really a very good indication of how good is their economy. So where do you see, where else do you see developing in the world in this respect? Where do you think the growth will be if you could make a prediction? The rule that uh, things uh, were moving uh, to east, (laughs) I think, uh, happens also here. And uh, now uh, probably the giants are uh, uh, are, uh, South Korea and China when it comes about shipbuilding, for example. You see with uh, Singapore, especially for uh, uh, somewhere there, especially for the offshore constructions, you see. I don't know exactly what will be the pandemic shock and uh, and Mm. the realization of uh, many governments uh, that something happens. Uh, I cannot see in states uh, something special about commercial shipbuilding. I see a lot of effort uh, or a lot of news about uh, uh, Navy shipbuilding. But mm-hmm. definitely, for example, uh, UK came um, apparently with a plan to expand the shipbuilding capability from the actual pretty much uh, Navy only to also back 
to commercial vessels. Why I'm saying back? Because uh, uh, UK, what in my opinion is the country of the, the naval architecture, was uh, pretty much uh, founded here. You see, in this country, but they had they they were all uh, on the on the cutting edge of shipbuilding, uh, maybe roughly until uh, 1950, 1960. And uh, something happens uh, definitively with the with the Margaret Thatcher period, but in that period uh, something happens for for the entire industries, heavy industries in UK. There was uh, a little bit of political fallout, wasn't there? Just yeah, before my time, but I do know about it. Yeah, uh, but uh, uh, what happens there has consequences now. Uh, not necessarily in the production, but I will say in the in the skilled uh, workforce. It's clear for me that the government uh, uh, want to do something, but I'm quite curious uh, what they will, how this, what will be done. I really don't know. But if I would be them, and to be honest, I applied at a certain point because uh, a certain commission, consultancy commission, was initiated here in in uh, in UK, and it was a call for uh, maritime and. Especially people with building experience to uh, to apply for this commission. And uh, okay, in my ingenuity, I says, uh, okay, let's apply for this uh, commission. Maybe I can bring something new uh, or something valuable. I didn't, but uh, okay, there are some big names on uh, on the list. It was not a very large list, you see. So, but uh, for example, uh, if I would be in that commission, I will say, guys, let's not be ashamed about recycling recycling mm-hmm. ships. Yeah, and why like this? Because in my personal opinion, recycling ships could be extraordinary workshop for automatization and robotization. It's a it's interesting. It's a really big topic within yachting. Actually, is one of the things that people talk about. Is we want we're trying to be green, we're trying to be sustainable. But you, how do you dispose of your boats? Can you especially if they are the ship? especially if they are glass fiber or or uh, things exactly. like this? It's exactly what happens with the with the big uh, blades uh, for the wind turbines. Yeah, but I think that the same discussion we have in society on even more larger scale when when it's about plastic. And I understood that the person uh, inventing uh, pretty much the basis of the plastic, uh, what ended up reasonable rich and his family, but uh, he never imagined that he will bring to the world such a trouble. Yes, exactly. He didn't know. Like the chap who invented TNT or whatever it was, you don't know. You don't know what you're doing when, until you do it. You know, you didn't realize、mm. it was going to be quite that popular when you invented it. <laughs> Now, on、um, on kind of a, a lighter note, before we get into talking about future of the ocean and then wrap this up, just quick thoughts on two things, and I think they fit pretty well. Number one, the principality of Sealand, and two, the Titanic. Have you heard of the Principality of Sealand? No. Well,、uh, it's this. this?、Um, it's this. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's、An、this oil rig. Sovereign state. That's it. Yeah, it's this oil rig that's、uh, right offshore, but it's far enough that it's not part of England. And yeah,、uh, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. no. But you know that it was also an attempt for doing something like this in Italy. Uh, mm-hmm. What、uh, yes, and it's a nice movie about this. Or for me, it was moving.、Uh, that moving, you see, because it's sad. It's sad because、uh, a similar structure, what was built by that people, not like this. Oh, pretty much,、uh, let's say, use it, but it、yeah. was existing already. You see, that one was destroyed apparently by the Italian navy. What? <laughs> Yes,、uh, the movie is very, very interesting and has connections. The law of the sea was modified. Uh, in order to not allow situation like that situation in Italy, so that one had consequences、uh, in the very very basic、uh, maritime, but it's marine or low of the sea. You see what is really really the very、uh, high level、uh, low of the seas. About that one, what I can tell you, it's a nice thing. To be honest,、uh, presumably is doing nothing wrong. I hope that they maintain. That platform, because this might be an issue, <laughs> because <laughs> it won't be so good that the rust will eat the the foundation of the principality. <laughs> you see, wouldn't be ideal, would it? <laughs> yeah. So I say, I I would say that probably considering the consequences of the story, the story from Italy 
it's more interesting that this one understood also this one had uh, some troubles uh, some uh, tentative to be really erased or occupied or whatever but yeah well, yeah it's some <laughs> it's some crazy stuff so yeah. what yeah. are your thoughts on uh the quick thoughts on the titanic i feel like that's you know embedded in the history of maritime and you uh, being an naval it's... architect it's very much embedded and uh, probably the the biggest consequence of Titanic, excepting the fact that the transverse bulkheads now are extended to the completely to the uh, load line deck, is the fact that uh, it triggered the process uh, what led to SOLAS, yeah. what is the convention of life saving uh, uh, at sea, of saving of life at sea. And uh, SOLAS, it's uh, really, really a cornerstone of uh, the maritime uh, world in any form and in any format. So, but it's exactly the same situation. A human tragedy, a big tragedy, triggered uh, the need of uh, reglementation, of regulation. What it's good, however, there are people saying that every tragedy triggers this need and this need uh, add layers of complexity to uh, this legislation. And indeed, uh, SOLAS type uh, uh, legislation, it's a multi layered legislation, very, very, very complex and complicated. From this point of view, for example, and I'm coming back uh, to uh, some part of our discussion about what this industry, uh, the offshore and the transportation can learn from each other. The Piper Alpha tragedy triggered a safety case legislation here in UK. And uh, pretty much the safety case legislation in UK was a big paradigm shift in the way how authorities and industry should look to the safety in the industry. In few words, the difference is that instead of having the authority or I don't know what convention defining for you uh, what are the safety issues, what are the risks, it's the duty holder. So it's a unique responsible in front of the law. Uh, what is doing its own best to define the risks depending uh, on what they are doing and where they are doing things. Interesting. So, you know, I guess kind of wrapping this up, where can people find you and hear more about your your thoughts? And I know that you have Future of the Ocean. Can you tell us about that? Uh, Future of the Ocean, it's a small initiative of... Um, I'm the founder, let's put it like this, but I have uh, uh, also my wife was, <laughs> I'm grateful to, to she that she accepted, let's say, to help me a little bit. Uh, also my nephew, for a while I had also uh, some students from Greece uh, helping me. Uh, now I have a gentleman from state uh, specialist in welding. Uh, you see, I have various uh, uh, guests helping me with interviews with uh, independent text and things like that. It's the site is like futureoftheocean.com. It's uh, in one word, future of the ocean. Not very inspired, honestly, name, but this is. The intention is pretty much to provide a platform for people like us, just the uh, people you see from the industry, to say something. This is because I have a feeling that uh, many publications, or let's put the media space, is dominated in this moment by uh, a lot of uh, names, or maybe not names, but roles and functions in the industry rather than uh, uh, really voices. And I says that uh, the normal person could have uh, something very interesting to say as well. And uh, democracy should work like this, you see. So Agora should be a place where not only the king or the uh, minister or the, I don't know what, the uh, very wealthy person will be allowed to say something. We need also the voice of the, of the regular person to say something. The workers. Yes. <laughs> and that's, and you know, that kind of uh, chimes with what we're doing as well, you know, with, uh, with this podcast. Obviously, everyone we get on is, is, is fab in their own way. But yeah, we want to have lots of different voices and lots of different perspectives from the industry. Isn't that right, mm -hmm. Meryl? Of course. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the other place what probably is more accessible, uh, it's LinkedIn, when I'm doing my best to manage uh, uh, two groups the maritime group and the shipbuilding industry and professional yeah the yeah we are we totally didn't bring up how you are the admin of one of the largest maritime groups on linkedin wow that sounds hard work i think uh, uh, yeah it's a lot of 
passion built in there. Uh, you see, so when when somebody is doing something with passion, probably the hard work uh, it's uh, put it a little bit aside, or the concept of hard work. But yes, probably my my wife will will agree very much with uh, uh, with you, Georgia. You see, she will say yes, it's a lot of hard work and time. Uh, uh, what you steal from me? <laughs> yes. Do you get shouted at and told to get off your phone by any chance? <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and maybe computer. <laughs> uh, but but I try also to build there some communities uh, uh, what are uh, uh, let's say more orientated, uh, uh, let's say to general discussions. It's interesting for me to observe there how shy is the regular professional uh, because I don't have no other conclusion that uh, people are shy in general. Uh, I doubt that they really don't have uh, something to discuss or to mm-hmm. say. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I ended up uh, with this, these two groups uh, pretty much doing uh, what now looks like a, a reader digest. The funny thing is that uh, my first contact uh, and for a while the only contact with a writer digest type publication was the Soviet Sputnik. <laughs> because if you remember I I was born and raised in communist time and era you see so uh and, and now looking to what happens there I, I I can see that something like this happens it's a kind of reader digest my wife told me yes it's normal that people will enter and will want to stay there because you are you and few another ones uh, you are just serving them uh, with a summary of the best of a very selected set of news of the day uh, so yeah it's normal that uh, instead of browsing i don't know how many publications they are going uh, in your groups and <laughs> they are just <laughs> reading the news there <laughs> yes <laughs> or the essential or the most important news but to be honest not this was my intention and when i'm continuing to uh, post things there every time when i do this i hope i pray that this will trigger a discussion Awesome, Marius. Well, it was amazing to, you know, hear all these thoughts and give a unique perspective that you don't really get to hear too often, especially in my industry. Yeah, recreational leisure marine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I feel my brain is fizzing with flying chickens and underwater cities and <laughs> off where I'm going to plan my next oil rig. Just a lot to think about, isn't there? Hopefully, yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for giving us all your insights. Um, I've, I've learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Check back every Tuesday for our latest episode and be sure to like, share and subscribe to ShipShape.pro.